Hello. Y'all need Jesus. I got another video. Yes. Um. Yeah. Isaiah 17. Man, I've been... Days just on this one chapter. It seems so important. And of course, with the news and what's going on, yeah, I guess it is. So, let's get into it. The burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will be, will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. Um, Yeah, things are going on right now over there. And for years I've been going, you know, watch Damascus. You know, watch the South China Sea too. You know, there's a lot of things you can watch. But this one is... Um, by a prophet in the Old Testament talking about something that is going to happen, a future event. I think it's sooner than later. Um, why am I wearing camo hat? Uh, war, or uh, conflict, world conflicts. Um, also, Ephesians 6, we fight, you know, not with flesh and blood, but, you know, powers and principalities, a spiritual battle. So, what does this all mean? Well, are there are there war or no conflicts in heaven? Yes, a spiritual battle going on. Does it kind of manifest in, or happen here on Earth? Uh, the results of it, sure. You know, there seems to be locations of strongholds of the evil ones. And we are supposed to pray and tear them down. Um, but I saw so many things in just this one chapter. So let's go over it. Uh, seven, uh, chapter Isaiah 17, verse 3. The fortress will cease from Ephraim um, and the kingdom from Damascus, which means, you know, uh, uh, the country that where the city is, yeah, it may fall. In fact, right now, the little tiny country is attacking all the countries that are around it. I won't use the names so I don't get flagged. Um, when I saw the fortress, I had to look it up. Um, during World War II, there was a bomber B-17, I think it is, which I like, wow, we're on Chapter 17, Right? Then I thought, well, what about in the oceans? Well, an aircraft carrier is called a fortress of the sea. Right? A, um, uh, like an airport, a floating airport um, to, to let uh, planes land or take off, or take off and land. Um, so, a fortress will cease from Ephraim. Ephraim, um, a lot of people say that the USA is Ephraim and Manasseh uh, is uh, the UK. I don't know. I mean, I always see analogies like Babylon, you know, America is called Babylon. And kind of rightly so. You know, the Statue of Liberty, Libertas, um, is not a woman. It's Lucifer. Turn it upside down and look at the lantern and tell me what you see, right? Uh, in Revelations, it talks about they'll no longer hear the voice of the bride or the bridegroom, um, and the lamp, the light of the lamp will go out or extinguish or something like that. I'm paraphrasing, so don't crucify the messenger. Um, so then, if Ephraim is the United States, then one of our floating fortresses will cease. Now, if you look at the Mount Rushmore in uh, South Dakota, there's Washington, Jefferson, uh, Roosevelt, and Lincoln. Lincoln and the Roosevelt are on the right side. And if you look at the numbers of the presidents, um, I think it's 16 and 26. I don't know. I, I looked at it at one point. 
Um, but the two floating fortresses that are over there in the M.E., you know, the middle of an eastern area, um, yeah, the aircraft Roosevelt, the aircraft uh, Lincoln are over there. Somewhere, you know, do I know the exact location? No. Um, but for a long time, I saw one of those two are going down. And it's been in so many movies. I think one of the Transformer movies had a an aircraft carrier um, sink, right? I think it was the Roosevelt. But I don't remember. Don't quote me. You know, I've seen so many movies and I see so many things in the movies, predictive programming, whatever else. Um, so, we know Damascus, that city's going to be a ruinous heap. How are you going to make a whole city a ruinous heap? Well, you take mushrooms and you make a cloud out of them. And they kind of like this bright orange. Now, if you go, if you want a, a, a study, uh, one of the videos I did, I don't remember the name of it, but I remember there was orange on one page and green on the other. And the orange side of the page talked about nuclear. And the green side was talking about the money. Um, failing. So, that's one way you're going to be able to destroy a, an entire city. You know, quickly. Um, the other thing is that I saw is uh, Isaiah 17, 4. In that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob will wane and the fatness of his flesh shall grow lean. Now, I read that. Where is Jacob? Israel. Right? Um, if the fatness goes lean and, he, and the glory wanes, that's a famine. Okay? Because the next verse, uh, verse 5, it shall be when the harvest harvester gathers the grain and reaps the heads with his arm. It shall be as he who gathers the head of grain in the valley of Rephim. I, I don't know. Hopefully I'm not de destroying that word. I don't know how to pronounce it. Okay. There, what popped in my head was a harvester gravit gathering grain. That's Revelations chapter 14. Okay. Reaps the heads with his arm. Um, I think it's uh, Proverbs. I don't know. There's a... a there. I'm all... I should have done an in-depth study, but I really have to get this out there, um, where God will use his right arm to gather in. Um, go search for it, right? But he gathers in with his arm the heads of grain. And we know that Matthew 13 or 25, um, I think it's Matthew 13. Um, which chapter? Don't know. Look it up. Um where the tares are bundled up and thrown in the fire burned, and then the wheat is taken into the barn. Um, the other thing that I saw when I was reading this was Jesus and his disciples were walking through a field of grain um, and plucking off the heads. Now, some translations say it's corn. Others say it's grain, which could be wheat. Um, and I know that the uh, the religious leaders are like, hey, it's the Sabbath. Why are you plucking off the grains and eating them? You know, and I, Jesus said to them, "Is like, didn't David eat the showbread, which is unlawful for him? You know, and uh, yet it was allowed. And then his response also was that, you know, that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath for men, not the men for Sabbath. Meaning, it's a day of rest, 
Like you can work and work and work and work and work. You do need to take one of the seven, which <laughs> that's 17, you know, one and seven. Uh, take one day out of the seven and rest. Rest from work, rest from all activities, right? And spend time with God. He's asking for a tidying of a tenth. You know, 90% is yours and, and give a tenth. Um, you can have six days to work and take one day to spend with me. You know, not just resting and having a good time, but also like, you know, spend it with the Lord. Of course, spend every day with the Lord. But he's making a point that, um, like the book of uh, Solomon, uh, Ecclesiastes. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ecclesiastes, where it's like work and to get rich is like vanity. It's like trying to grasp for the wind. But anyways, the point of this is that I saw Jesus, you know, when I'm reading this, it's like he's walking through and plucking the grains of head. What's going to happen during the rapture? Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, 5, something like that. And 1 Corinthians 15, it's like, God's going to send out his angels to gather in from the four winds, um, you know, his people, the ones that are chosen, you know. And it's almost like there's two harvests, two gatherings. One, like in Matthew, where they gather up the tares and throw them in the fire, you know, and then gathers in his grain. Um, we are his grain. We are wheat. You know, in the Bible, it's like referring to his saints, his chosen one, the believers. We are called trees. We are called grass. Uh, and we are called grain. And he uses these examples, you know. Um, and, okay, let's go on. Uh, Isaiah 17, verse 6. And yet gleaning the grapes will be left in it. And I went, wow, the grapes of wrath. Revelations chapter 14, the harvest of um, the wheat and then the harvest of the, the grapes. And those are the grapes of wrath that I will have to go through the wrath of God. <clears throat> and you can see it. Yet the gleaning of grapes will be left in it. Those are the ones left behind. I mean, this is all one chapter, and, and I'm seeing all this stuff. Uh, seventeen verse six, chapter seventeen verse six. Like the shaking of an olive tree, um, the earth is the field, right? In the field of trees, you know. Will the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives at the top of the uppermost burrow, the first fruits, the first ones, two or three, right? I'm thinking, wow, that's 23, which we see this number everywhere. In fact, they did a movie, 23. Um, you know, and then it says four or five in its most fruitful branches, four or five, right? There's a president. 45, you know. Um, the 2 and 3 is like 23 and me, we're doing DNA. Okay, while president number 45, you know, is, was in power, whatever else. Okay, so another future event, um, Isaiah 17, 7, which is 117, which I've seen everywhere. Uh, in that day, man will look to his maker and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. Um, in Revelations, uh, I don't remember which chapter it is, they will look upon um, their maker at, with mourning, like the mourning of uh, only son. Um, it talks about how the eyes of Israel will be open and they will see the one that they had pierced, okay? Um, and then in chapter, verse 8, he will not look to his altars, the work of his hands, 
you will not respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden images or the incense altars. Now, the work of the hands, the things that fingers have made, wooden images or incense altars. That's all religion. I mean, at first point, I thought, oh, wow, wooden images and incense altars, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. But then I thought, wait, there's wooded images and incense altars in the Asian religions, right? And in the Middle Eastern religions. And the Eastern Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox and the Ro R Russian Orthodox. Okay, so all these religions, and I bet there's more of them, right? All have um, the works of their hands, which are idols, right? Uh, wooden images and incense altars. So, uh, the other thing that hit me while I was reading this is religion is a man's way to work to God. Jesus Christ is God's solution to get man into a relationship with God. And what hinders us? Adam, Eve disobeyed. Two trees, tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They went for the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and they say, well, we were tricked by... Uh, the serpent, you know, and they kept pointing the finger and blame, blame, blame. What had happened was they were disobedient. They sinned. Sin is disobedience. Um, and that curse extends to all of us because we are all of mankind, uh, descendants of Adam and Eve and descendants of Noah and his family because only eight people survived and there's eight billion on the earth. Hmm. Eight new beginnings um, on the eighth day, that great day. So there'll come a time where religion, nope, uh, relationship, yep. Okay. Why do we have wooden images and incense altars and the work of our hands? Well, Isaiah chapter 17, verse 10, which is 171. Uh, because you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. And then it talks about um, the day of grief and, the, and desperate sorrow. Because why? Because they'd rather go after the works of their hands and the traditions of men and things added in um, that you have to do in order to get yourself to work yourself into heaven because you can work, you know, your way. And yet, God says, our righteousness is like filthy rags. And I gave you Ten Commandments and, it, you know, and the law. And if you break one little part of it, you've broken all of it. So you have to be perfect. And no one is perfect. There was only one man who walked this earth who was perfect. That was Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. You know, he came down, made himself lower than the angels. This is God. His firstborn son coming down, walking among us in the flesh, miracles, healings, raising the dead, casting out demons, and so much more. That's not written in this book. Um, and yet, God loved us so much, he sent his only son to die for us, to shed his blood, because the only way to cover up sin and to say, okay, um, I'll excuse your disobedience because I've seen the shedding of innocent blood, a lamb. Um, Jesus is our lamb. He went to the cross willingly, knowingly, um, to be the sacrifice, the atonement, you know, for us. He didn't have to die for us. And yet he did. Excuse me. Because he knew that by his death, many souls will be saved. 
because God is a righteous God. Um, he will forgive our sins by the blood of his Son, which covers our sins. We have an advocate in heaven. Every time Satan accuses us of, oh, he sinned, he's, you know, worthy of death, we all are worthy of death. Um, but we come to the realization that the salvation is a free gift from God, right? Lest any man should boast. By the faith that he gives us to believe in his son. That yes, he did die for all of us. And he did die for our sins. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sins. He sees the blood that's covering our sins. And so then we can be made righteous through his overcoming of the world. How did he overcome the world? Well, he was nailed to the cross. He shed his blood for us. Three days in the grave, preaching to the prisoners. And then you can look that in Luke 16. The beggar Lazarus and the rich man. And the big chasm and divide between. And Abraham's bosom, or paradise. Um, and then Jesus rose from the dead. Three days later after his death, and he said, I lay down my life willingly and I will pick it back up. And he did. The Holy Spirit, Father God, raised him from the dead. And then he went preaching to 40 days, more than 500 people. Um, and then he was taken up in the clouds, just floated up, you know. And the angel said, why are you gawking and looking up at the clouds? He's coming back the same way. And he said he's coming back. So he's made that promise. So we have the hope of the resurrection. Because if he was raised from the dead, so will we. Um, that's called faith and hope. Faith is things unseen. So he promised it. We're waiting. We're watching. Uh, the Jews didn't know his time of visitation. And on Palm Sunday or... You know, the day he came in and everybody said, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means God save us. Um, they're waving palm trees. You know, and you can see in Book of Revelations that there will be in heaven palms and harps and singing how great the Lamb is and what he did. And he redeemed us from many nations and many peoples and many tongues and, and um, by his blood. It says it, by his blood. So, um, I noticed in Isaiah 17, verse 12, Woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roars of seas and the rushing of nations, that make a rushing like the rushing of many waters. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters. And then, of course, God says he will break them and they will be far away. Um, just now, we've had two pretty big hurricanes on the east coast of the United States and flooded. Cities are gone. People are, are hurting without water, um, supplies, or anything else. You know, and I'm thinking, wow, what's a multitude of many, the multitude of many people? We are a nation, a melting pot of many different people. And, of course, you know, come here legally, Join the party, learn to assimilate, you know, don't hate us, be like us, you know. Um, and this is one of the many nations of the earth, probably one, largest, I think the largest one that has all the nations conglomerating here. There's other countries, and I've, I have gone around the world and visited places, and they're predominantly like, we are one country, and this is what we are. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, um, I'll use Japan as an example, but they're like 80 90% or more uh, Japanese. You know, that's their culture. That's their language. This is who we are, right? They don't have a lot of um, foreigners or, or um, uh, people immigrating there. Uh, and that's like a lot of different countries. You know, they are 
their own. And they have their borders. And, and you know, yes, there are different clashes between the nations and stuff. You know, we happen to be the one with a multitude of many people sitting on two great bodies of water. Um, so, like Matthew, pretty sure it's 13, um, that the tares will be gathered, and I repeat this, and burned up in the fire and blown away like chaff in the wind. So here I am uh, in Isaiah 17, verse 13, talking about the rushing waters, and we're having hurricanes, right? Um, and it says, and be like, and be chased like the chaff of mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. The whirlwind can be a tornado or a hurricane, right? In different translations, uh, yeah. In fact, one translation says hurricanes, right? And then behold, at even tide trouble, Right now we know that Isaiah seventeen verse four and that the glory of Jacob will wane. Jacob's trouble, when's even tide? That's at twilight. It's not fully dark. It's not fully light. It's evening time. Right. So what does it say? At evening time trouble, and before the morning he is no more. Meaning from evening till dawn. Something's happening in nighttime. Destruction, right? Trouble. And it will be over in the morning. Now, Jesus says he comes like a thief in the night. And many, many different um, verses throughout the Bible talk about sudden destruction at noonday, like midnight, you know, um, in one hour. So, yes, a major conflict worldwide that in one hour, you know, a nuclear exchange could definitely uh, happen within one hour and massive destruction. It could be a volcano and it would be, be darkness at daytime. God can do whatever he wants to do, you know. Could be a huge, you know, planet blocks the sun. Three hours. Right? From the crucifixion, the sixth watch to the ninth watch, which is three hours, three, six, nine, which I got today. Um, actually, what I got was 30, 60, and 90 days, which is October, November, December. You know, take away the zeros, it's three, six, nine. Crucifixion started at the third watch. The sun went dark, and there was um, three hours of darkness, which could be related to our three days of darkness, which is Noah, or no, um, Moses, that there was darkness on the land for three days. You know, God keeps saying the same thing, just using different ways to say it, you know. And then he gave up the ghost and died at the ninth watch, which is our third hour. Because if you look at our clock, it's completely backwards. 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m., which ends up being the um, third watch, the sixth watch, the ninth watch. Anyways. So, what else does it say in Revelations 17, 14? Then behold, at even tide trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us the, and the lot of those who rob us. The people in charge, uh, the elites, uh, whoever you want to call them, you know, um, have plundered us and robbed from us by taxing and, and just stealing or whatever else, you know. Um, at one point, God's going to call them out. And say, no more, you know. And they're going to be poof, dust in the wind, right? Ashes. Chaff is, is the word that they use, right? It says there'll be ashes under our feet. 
and he gives us the authority to trample on uh, scorpions and snakes. So, one chapter, uh, it has not happened yet. But it will, because God says it has. Um, so, watch. Watch what's going on around you, but keep your eyes on Jesus, Yeshua. You know, because I know... Okay. It's good to know what your enemy is doing. It's better to be focused on what your God, your Lord, your commander, right? He's the um, the Lord of hosts, right? He's in charge. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Um, all authority has been given to him um, on heaven and on earth and under heaven and under earth. So, Everybody's got to follow his orders, like it or not. Now, of course, the good angels, yes, sir, you know, how, what can I do for you, you know, and his servants. Even the demons, the fallen angels, Lucifer and Satan, and you can look in the book of Job, chapter one, you know, Satan asked God, what do you think about Job? Or actually it was God saying, what do you think about my servant Job? You know, and of course, Satan, our accuser, is sitting there going, nah, 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 nah. You know, and yet we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus. You know, and his blood covers our sins to rebuke Satan. You already defeated him on the cross. Now it's just a matter of going through the book. You know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No, no other name given under heaven by which you can be saved. Um, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Call out to him today. If you don't believe him, ask him to make himself real to you. He will. You know, many different ways. You have to look for it. Um, and the wages of sin is death. Being disobedient to God, you will die. Physical death, spiritual death. Thrown in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But the free gift of God is eternal life through His Son. You can have eternal life through His Son. How do you do that? First, Recognize and acknowledge I have sinned, which makes you a sinner, me a sinner, okay? We have sinned, knowingly or unknowingly, like the thief on the cross. I am a thief. I deserve this. You don't. You're an innocent man, right? He also recognized that he was God because he asked him, and he recognized he was a king because he said, Remember we, when you come into your kingdom. That means he had to know that he was king of Israel, king of the world, you know, that he was God. And he had a kingdom. And he begged him and asked him, please remember me when you go, when you are coming into me. So he knew that he was going to die. Jesus was going to die. The other thief was going to die. You know, and yet he was going to enter into paradise. Abraham's bosom, Luke 16. Um, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That act of faith, God gives a free gift of eternal life, believing in his Son. And then you, by logical extension, you have to believe that there's a Father God who sent his Son, who created everything through him and with him by him. John chapter 1. You know, and then he's also got a plan to come back, save those are, that are his, that Father God has given to his son, and has granted eternal life, 
to them through faith by grace. Grace is a free gift. Can't earn it. You know, you can reject grace, but I wouldn't do it. So it's a free gift of God to give you eternal life and to let you come into his kingdom. That's awesome. But so many are rejecting his son, which by extension rejects Father God and his plan of salvation, saying, I don't need it. I don't want it. So then when the throne of judgment comes, that God is going to say, I gave you a way out. I gave you a door. I gave you my son. He died for you. He shed his blood for you so that you could be with me in paradise and be in my kingdom, in heaven. You know? Um, and he's going to set up his kingdom here on earth too. Mount Zion, uh, a new Jerusalem that's going to come down from heaven to earth. But if you don't want it, what are you going to say on Judgment Day? I didn't know. So many people have told you. And there's a billion copies of the Bible in many different languages. The most publicized book ever. Guinness Book of World Records. Right? So there's no excuse. And even the enemy has to tell you things. Want to or don't want to, they have to. You know? So they're exposing truth with a whole bunch of lies and God's exposing all of his truth or the truth that he wants to give us, right? He doesn't have to reveal all to us, but what we need. And he put it in a book. And a lot of people say, well, it was written by men, so it's flawed. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. God tells you one, two, three. And you tell somebody else, one, two, three. How do you know? God told me. One, two, three. Well, I don't believe you. You're a man. Yeah, but God told me. And he doesn't lie. And I'm just repeating what he told me. One, two, three. And there are people out there that will screw it up and say three, two, one. You know, trying to get us to, to not believe. And yet, he tells you, Why? are the judgments. Why are we being punished? Isaiah chapter 17 verse 10. Because you have forgotten the God of your salvation and not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. Right? Now, or the rock of your refuge. Right? He will save you. C call out to him. Right? So. Anyways. Love you guys. This is long enough. Um. I hope you gleaned something out of this. But it kind of tells us the timing of Damascus, um, Jacob or Israel, you know, will a famine of what kind? Um, spiritual, physical, we'll see, right? But then it says, shall be when a harvest grain happens. Um, so the timing of the rapture, Damascus, uh, Jacob's troubles, you know, and uh, whirlwinds and rushing waters. I mean, I, mm, Luke 21, uh, Matthew 24. Anyways, see you guys in the next video. Love you, love you, love you, love you, love you.